He's been very involved in the climate change environment. He's the past chair of the American Solar Energy Society, and he led production of the 200-page ACES Taking, Tackling Climate Change in the U.S. report. And he's an adjunct professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder, where he developed the course Climate Change Solutions. Dr. Kucher? As Max mentioned, I work at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I often give talks about renewable energy and how they can address climate change. <clears throat> So today I'm going to do something different. Max saw a presentation I gave a couple weeks ago, and he asked if I would just focus on some of the skeptic arguments. And so I'm going to do that today, and that more or less I'll be giving it as an individual presentation, not really as a representative NREL today. OK, the first thing I want to do is point out that, uh, I think Casper pointed out, it's been over a century that scientists have known about global warming, about what greenhouse gases do. But even in the in, in the popular media in this country. We've known about it for a long time. If you go back to 1958, I'm going to show a short clip from the Bell Telephone Science Theater that was on television. Extremely dangerous questions, because with our present knowledge, we have no idea what would happen. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottomed boats would be viewing the drowned towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. Foreign weather were not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicist encounters, but with life itself. There was a bit of dramatization there. I think no one is expecting that kind of sea level rise for several centuries. We'd have to lose all of the, uh, uh, the East Antarctic ice sheet for sea level to rise that high. Uh, but still, the sea level rise that's projected for 2100 is, is quite alarming, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So if you go to a local bookstore and you look for books about global warming, climate change, these are the kinds that you're typically going to see. The uh, Politically Incorrect Guide to Global Warming, Global Warming and Other Eco-Myths. Uh, basically, books arguing it's a big hoax, it's some sort of a left-wing conspiracy. Apparently, it's been going on since 1958. Uh, but these are the kinds of books that you'll see. And similarly, if you tune in television, you'll see all sorts of uh, TV shows. Uh, laughing about it. What a joke it is. Can you believe people really believe that we're warming the planet? So we have an uphill battle to fight. And in fact, what you can do, if you look at a Gallup poll that was taken in 2009, you can see that there's an incredible split uh, between uh, the different political parties. Uh, what political party you belong to probably says more about what you think of the science of global warming than anything else, which is, a, uh, I think, quite an indictment of, of how seriously we take scientific facts. So if you look here, percentage saying news of global warming is exaggerated by party identification. 66% of Republicans in 2009 felt it was exaggerated. 22% of Democrats, 44% of independents. So there's a, a, a huge split. You know, these people have different political philosophies, and they also get their sources of information from different television stations, different news media. And this is a Gallup poll that just came out very recently, just last year, and it just shows everybody and the, the percent of American people that think global warming is generally exaggerated. And look at the way it's gone up in the last couple of years. Now, part of it, of course, could be due to the economy. When, when people are worried about their job, about their future, about paying their mortgage, uh, you know, whether they can afford to, to live in their house or not, well, things like global warming are just not as important. So that makes sense. But also, I think what we're seeing is, is the impact of a very, very effective, well-heeled misinformation campaign. So you might remember ClimateGate, OK? That was when uh, these emails were hacked from these scientists at the Climatic Research Unit in England. And uh, it was all over the internet. And you saw all sorts of news. And e even the term ClimateGate, what does that evoke? I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the Watergate. 
Uh, and, and Watergate was not really so much about a burglary, a small-time burglary. It was really about a big cover-up. That's, that's the kind of image that Watergate evokes, and that's the kind of image that they wanted you to think of when you think of ClimateGate. These scientists, uh, you know, they're, they're keeping to themselves the real truth. In fact, they know it's a hoax. What those, what those emails really revealed is that scientists, in fact, are very, very frustrated. How do we get the truth out to these people? They're frustrated that their data will be misused. Uh, that's what you see when you read those emails. But there was all sorts of news about ClimateGate. But then this was investigated, actually, by, by six different panels altogether. I'm going to show you the results of three of them. You didn't see this in the news. All right, so this happened in England. But first, the British Parliament Science and Technology Committee reviewed all these hacked emails and concluded in March 31st, 2010, the committee found no reason in this inquiry to challenge a scientific consensus. That was followed up by Lord Oxburgh's Science Assessment Panel on April 14th. We saw no evidence of any deliberate scientific malpractice in any of the work of the Climatic Research Unit. And finally, a uh, panel on July 7th, again, a totally independent panel concluded, we find that their rigor and honesty as scientists are not in doubt. This did not make the news. You didn't see this in the news. Well, I would encourage you to look at these books. If you want to know what's going on with this misinformation campaign, Climate Cover-Up by James Hogan, he's a public relations expert. And then Naomi Reskes and her co-author uh, wrote Merchants of Doubt. Uh, and this Merchants of Doubt, what it really does is it goes through the whole history of these misinformation campaigns, starting with, DD, starting with, uh, with DDT and tobacco and going through all these different things. The common denominator, as these authors point out, is, is the fact that there, there are many people that, that feel very strongly about a, a free capitalistic market and so are very against anything that hints of government regulation. So that's sort of the common denominator, whether it's uh, uh, banning, whether it's uh, uh, putting warnings on cigarette packs, uh, banning DDT, uh, putting a price on carbon. These involve government regulation. There are people very, very opposed to that. And as these authors point out, that is the common denominator. OK, so what I'm going to do is go through some of the skeptic arguments. Now, th there's, there's one uh, rural electric co-op in Colorado that has actually invested a lot of money and time and effort into going around the state, giving presentations, on, on, on the point, making the point that climate change is a big hoax, you don't need to worry about it. So I drew a lot of these arguments from, from their slideshow, but, uh, but also a few others as well. Okay, so here's one of them. And, and, and you, you might think of a couple different categories here. One category is uh, climate change, you know, it's not happening. That's one of the arguments. Well, if that doesn't work, they fall back on, well, yeah, okay, it's happening, but it's, we're not causing it. And, and I think, uh, you know, the, the previous speaker, Casper, did a great job of explaining, you know, human fingerprints, but I'm going to go into that as, as well. So uh, in this first category, climate change isn't happening, they make the point it was warmer during the medieval warm period, and also the IPCC has dropped Michael Mann's hockey stick curve, that curve that shows uh, a sudden increase in, in temperature in our, in our century here, all right? So here's the, I see this, this over and over again. What I really get a kick out of this curve is, I, I don't know if you can see it clearly enough, but here's 1800, here's 1900. It ends around 1950. So they don't even show all the temperature rise. Remember how you saw in the previous graphs that the real impact of global warming has been in the last three decades? That doesn't even show up in this plot that makes it all over the internet as evidence that, look, it was a lot warmer back in the medieval warm period. But again, there was a lot of debate about this Michael Mann's hockey stick. People didn't like that. OK, so what's the scientific reality here? Well, Congress asked the National Academy of Sciences to review the hockey stick curve that the skeptics had so much criticism of. And the National Academy of Sciences back in 2006 came out with a 160-page report, a very detailed report looking at Michael Mann's hockey stick. What did they conclude? Well, basically, not, a, not only did they back up Michael Mann's hockey stick, but they said, you know what? There's lots of hockey sticks, depending on whether you look at the temperatures based on tree rings, glacier lengths, borehole temperature measurements. Each one of these different colors represents a different way to detect the temperature in the northern hemisphere over the last 1,000 years. And all these curves show this trend where, yeah, it was a little bit warm in the medieval warm period. It cooled down a bit. But this very, very sudden rise uh, at the end of our century, all of these show that. Their conclusion, the committee finds it plausible that the Northern Hemisphere was warmer during the last few decades of the 20th century than during any comparable period over the preceding millennium. This is also the, uh, this is the 2000, uh, 
uh, 7 IPCC report. And what you can see here uh, is the, uh, uh, all, the, all these various hockey stick curves. What I find interesting, too, is that the skeptics uh, also make the point that the IPCC you know, dropped the hockey stick. They were so embarrassed by this hockey stick curve that the latest report didn't even include it. That's completely untrue. If you look at page 467, I believe, of the report, uh, it's right there, uh, along with many others. So Michael Mann's curve is one of those in here. And if you look at the details, again, here it is. These are all the different curves. So they're very similar to what the National Academy of Sciences showed, but these are the curves that are shown in the latest IPCC report. And I'm, one thing I like to do is I like to pass this report around because I, I like people to feel the weight of the evidence. This is just volume one. Now, the IPCC has been doing this since 1990. This is the fourth series of reports they come out with. Every four years, the world's top scientists on climate science review all the literature. So this is not, they didn't do original work. All they do in here is quote all the results of the literature. So I'm going to pass this around. This is volume one, the physical science basis. And again, this, this particular graph is on page 467 of that report. OK, uh, another skeptic argument. 1934 was the hottest year on record. 1934. It wasn't 1998. It wasn't 2005. Well, you know, there's often an element of truth to these things. 1934 was the hottest year in the United States. The United States represents a pretty small fraction of the total land area of the planet. What we're really looking at, and to get really good statistics, we need to look at the whole planet. We need to average all that out and see what's happening. And if you look at the world, Hadley in England had 1998 as the, as the highest temperature year. The Goddard Institute for Space Studies and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration have 2005 as the warmest year. Why the difference? Because there's limited data in the Arctic. We know the Arctic is really heating up faster than any other part of the planet. Hadley said, well, we don't have data in the Arctic. We're not including it. What Goddard and NOAA did independently is they said, well, look, we have some stations in the Arctic. We're going to interpolate and average that land in there, which makes a lot more sense to me. And they showed 2005 as the hottest year. In any case, the hottest decade on record was 2001 and 2010. 2010 may be the warmest year on record. We don't know yet. They're still analyzing the data. The second hottest decade, 1991 to 2000. The third hottest decade, 1981 to 1990. Do you see a trend there? So here's what the data looks like. It's got a lot of noise in it. Why does it have a lot of noise? Mostly because of El Nino-La Nina cycles, partly because of volcanic uh, eruptions. In 1991, Mount Pinatubo caused a big dip here. We even saw it in solar plants. Their output went down because of the, uh, the sulfate aerosols that were injected into the atmosphere by that eruption in the Philippines. Um, and also, the 11-year sunspot cycles have some impact. Not as big as these others, but they have an impact as well. And so you see there's a lot of noise here. And so you can see the temperature was going up. It sort of leveled out here. Around 1970, we passed the Clean Air Act in the United States. And we're back on this track. You can see this trend here. What do you do with noisy data? What, you, what, what, what students are taught to do with noisy data is you use running averages to filter out the noise. So what this curve shows is a running average, a 133-month average. Why is that? Because that's 11 years. 11 years is a sunspot cycle. So to average out the sunspot cycle, they use a running average of 133 months. And you can see this is Goddard, this is Hadley, NOAA. Uh, these are results from, uh, from satellite measurements. They all show the same thing. And namely, the latter part of this century, a very steady rise in temperature. 2008 was a particularly cool year, a very, very extended La Nina, which coincided with the bottom of a sunspot cycle. So there's a little bit of dip there in 2008. But you can see this general, strong general trend of upward temperature. That's the air temperature for the planet. If you look at the ocean, the ocean has a much uh, a higher volumetric heat capacity than air does. Okay. So a small temperature rise in the ocean means a lot of heat. And so this is how much heat is going into the atmosphere. But look at all the heat going into the ocean. And if you, when, they, when scientists go measure the temperature distribution in the ocean, the surface temperature, the temperature at depth, that temperature profile can only be mimicked by models that account for greenhouse gases, not do any solar effects, for example. Here's another argument. Polar bear populations, they're growing. What are you worried about polar bears for? Well, at one point, there was a ban put on hunting polar bears. 
Guess what? When they stopped hunting polar bears, the population rose. But in fact, if you look at the population of polar bears today, if you look at the scientific reality, the group that studies this, the polar bear specialist group, found in 2005, okay, there's 12 different populations of polar bears at the, in, in the north the area of the North Pole, all right? Out of those 12, in 2005, five were declining, five were stable, and two were increasing. In 2009, when they went back and took data, eight out of the 12 were declining, three were stable, one was increasing. Uh, clearly a big decline in the population of polar bears. Not in every population group, but in virtually in most of them. This is what the U.S. Geological Survey recently concluded when they studied this issue. Projected changes in future sea ice conditions, if realized, will result in loss of approximately two-thirds of the world's current polar bear population by the mid-21st century. Skeptics say there's no consensus on climate change. Well, there's no consensus depending on who you talk to, okay? So let's look at this study done in 2009. And what they did is they asked the question, are humans a significant contributor to climate change? And the response you get depends on the group. And so if we start here, let's look at the people that said yes. Let's just look at these. These bars going from left to right represent increasing knowledge of climate change. So this bar is for the general public. Probably if they repeated this in 2010, it would be lower now. But back in 2009, about 58% of the American public thought humans were a significant factor uh, in, in climate change. And then they go down the line here, the next bar is um, uh, scientists, but they don't work in the field of climate science. And ultimately you go down and the very last bar is climate science experts who actively publish in the peer-reviewed scientific journals. So you can see as you increase the knowledge of this area, it goes up. And when you look at the experts in this field, 97% of them agree that climate change is caused by human activity. Here's another one you hear. It's the sun. It's the sun that's causing global warming. It's not greenhouse gases. What's the reality? Well, and, and this, this alludes back to something that, that Casper pointed out earlier. <clears throat> there are certain patterns of heating we would expect if the sun were increasing in its output, or even if the sun indirectly had some impact on the heating of the planet. Somehow it was giving more energy to the planet. Essentially, if it was the sun, Basically, both the upper and the lower atmosphere would be warming. They'd both absorbing some sunlight, okay? If it's greenhouse gases, as Casper pointed out, those greenhouse gases, they trap the radiation. They trap that infrared radiation from going back into space. As a result, the troposphere, the lower atmosphere, warms up, but the stratosphere is somewhat insulated and, is, and cools down. So what do we see? You look at the results. Again, this is from a peer-reviewed journal. Everything I'm showing you is from peer-reviewed scientific journals. Upper atmosphere is cooling, lower atmosphere is warming, clear, clear sign of greenhouse gas heating. Same thing, what would you expect uh, if the sun were heating the earth, okay? You would expect warm days, number of warm days to be increasing, but number of warm nights to be decreasing. We see just the opposite. We see warm nights increasing, warm days decreasing. Why is that? Because Nights cool by radiating heat off to space. That heat is being bounced back by those greenhouse gases we're adding to the atmosphere. But I think the best evidence is the fact that, guess what? We can actually measure the output of the sun. We have satellites that measure exactly the output of the sun. And so here you look from 1880 to 2000. Uh, the blue curve here is the solar irradiance. The top curve is that temperature, similar to what I showed you before. And you can see, as Casper pointed out, you know, if you get to about 1960, 1970, yeah, they track pretty closely. But you look at the last three decades, and there's a real fingerprint of what we're doing to the atmosphere. The temperature's going up, and in fact, there was a slight cooling in the last three decades that would have resulted from the sun. If the sun were the driver, the planet would have cooled. It wouldn't have warmed up. And again, this is a plot that, that, that Casper showed. This is from the IPCC report that I just passed around. All of these are man-made effects. Some of them cause cooling, some of them, cause, like CO2, cause warming. If you look at all the man-made effects, that gives you this bar. Now, this goes back to 1750. This is just in the last 30 years. So this is looking at the whole history of us adding fossil fuels, uh, burning fossil fuels in the atmosphere. And you can see that here's the total man-made effect. Here's the effect over the last uh, uh, several centuries of the sun. A slight heating effect if you go back far enough due to the sun. But again, the big driver is what we're doing to the atmosphere. 
Skeptics say computer models are unreliable. What's the reality? These models have been developed since the 1960s. Warren Washington up at NCAR was one of our uh, pioneer modelers. He's been doing this for decades, okay? When they started, they had very little uh, in terms of what they could actually model. And each decade, they've done more and more until finally they're, they're coupling the atmosphere and the ocean. Uh, they're bringing in uh, vegetation. They're bringing in all these different effects. The one big one that's still difficult for them to model is ice sheet disintegration. Dynamical changes in ice sheets. Very hard for them to model. And they're still, they're still working on that one. But basically, a great increase in what they can model over the years. Here's the model resolution. This is for each of the IPCC reports going back to 1990, the first one, the second, the third, the fourth. Look what ha has happened to the model resolution. My first job was uh, for Sperry Rand back in 1973, and I, 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 uh, I worked as a programmer. I had a, a bachelor degree in physics, so they didn't hire physicists with bachelor degrees, so I worked as a programmer. And we were very proud of the twin UNIVAC 1108 computers that we had. These were like among the world's most powerful computers. Uh, and, and these little PCs that I have up here right now are way more powerful than what those twin UNIVAC 1108s could do back in 1973. There's been an incredible growth, exponential growth in the computing power of computers. And so over the years, these, we've gotten more and more resolution. We can do finer and finer models, and the models not only are independent around the world and all agree with each other, but they're showing that they come, they come with greater and greater certainty that in fact uh, it's, it's what we're doing to the atmosphere that's causing this. And again, this is also a, a plot that Casper showed. And you can see this is from a, a, a paper that, of which Casper uh, was one of the authors. And, and I mentioned Warren Washington, one of the, the pioneer modelers. He's one of the authors, too. Those in your back can't see this. But uh, a number of, of key climate scientists were involved in this collaboration. And they looked at the models. They ran the models. And they tried to reproduce the last century. And the point is, the black line is the actual temperature rise over the last century. And the blue is the range of model results they get if they don't include the, the, the man-made effects. When they include the man-made effects, it tracks right on. They cannot reproduce what happened in the last century unless they include what we've been doing to the atmosphere. Skeptics say mankind has raised the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere by only a few percent. There's lots of greenhouse gases up there. Okay, we've only increased it a few percent. It's an element of truth to that. If you look at... If, First, first of all, let me look at, well, let's look at what's happened to the concentration of carbon dioxide. Here are those 100,000-year cycles that you see in, in, in carbon dioxide. And here are the temperatures. Okay? Now, these cycles were driven by changes in orbital parameters of the Earth and how the sun heats the Earth. But the types of temperature changes we see, the temperature increase we see after an ice age, can only be explained by carbon dioxide feedback, by CO2, the greenhouse gas, helping to warm the atmosphere. And so we've seen it varying between 190 parts per million and 290 parts per million in these 100,000 year cycles. It's now way up here. It's now at 390. This is a dramatic change. It's not only way out of bounds with where it's been as far as we can go back in the ice core record, 800,000 years, but it's, it's going up at an incredible pace. This is something that moved at a snail's pace over 100,000 years. Okay, now it's going up 2 ppm per year. We have, we have any baby boomers in here? OK, let me give you a point of reference. Um, an easy point of reference for the baby boom generation, 1950. OK? Consider this. Now, carbon dioxide is a fundamental constituent of our atmosphere. It's as small as a trace gas, but it's really powerful in terms of what it does in terms of blocking infrared radiation. OK? The amount of carbon dioxide that was in the air, that's in the air now, OK, that we're all breathing right now, this air, today, has 25% more carbon dioxide in it than the air that was in the first breath you took when you were born in 1950. We've taken a fundamental constituent of the atmosphere, increased it by 25% in a human lifetime. That's, that's amazing. Can, can you imagine if you went to the Environmental Protection Agency and said you wanted to do some project? Oh, and by the way, it's going to increase the, the, the concentration of CO2 by 25% in the atmosphere. I don't think you get approval for that. Okay, but what about this thing saying that, well, look, we're only adding a small percent to the greenhouse gases that are up there. Well, actually, that's true, because a lot of the greenhouse gas is water vapor. And if you look at all the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, thank God we have them, because the Earth is 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it would be if it didn't have those greenhouse gases. All the oceans would be frozen. The reason we have liquid water on the planet is because all those greenhouse gases trap 
the outgoing infrared radiation. And so the point is that, yes, we've only added a couple percent to the greenhouse gases so far, and so we've raised the temperature of the Earth about 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So the amount that we've added, even though it's a small percent to the total when you look at, the carbon look at all the water vapor and everything up there, it's having a significant impact because all those greenhouse gases have a big impact. All right? And if you look, uh, project out to 2100, conservatively, we'll probably see 5.5 degree Fahrenheit temperature rise. Now basically, that's real conservative. If you look at the emission scenarios that were developed back in 2000, we're above the worst case scenario. So in fact, this 5.5 degrees is, is way too conservative. Some people are saying if we stay on the path we're at now, we could raise the temperature of the, of the Earth's atmosphere 10 degrees Fahrenheit by 2100. Skeptics say the IPC lowered their predictions for sea level rise. That report I'm passing around right now, if you look at the table of sea level rise by 2100, has a, has a smaller sea level rise projection for the worst case scenario than the report six years earlier. Why is that? Did the IPCC finally have some sense? Did they finally realize it, that they're grossly overestimating what's happening in global warming? Let's look at the reality. The IPCC report in 2001 the worst case scenario, for the worst emission scenario, they said by 2100, we're going to about, get about 9 tenths of a meter of sea level rise. 2007, that number went down to 0.59. Why did that happen? Why the so-called decrease? Well, in 2001, they included in their estimate this ice sheet dynamics. What happens when the ice sheets break up? What that's going to do to sea level rise? That it's not just thermal expansion of the oceans. It's these ice sheets disintegrating. In 2007, and I think partly because of, of all the criticism they're constantly under, they really said, let's, let's really nail down uncertainties here. Let's look at how well we know each one of these things. And if we don't know it really well, we'll leave it out until we know it better. And so they decided in 2007 they would not include ice sheet dynamics. And so they left it out, and so that number went down to 0.59. The uncertainty was considered too large, but they did note in there that the effect could be very, very large. And in fact, what we're seeing is the latest scientific papers on sea level rise are showing considerably higher values than even the number back in 2001 when they look at this ice sheet dynamics. So if you look at that report I passed around, they say constantly that they could not really address future rapid dynamical changes in ice flow. And if you look here, this is called a moulin. This is the Greenland ice sheet. The Greenland ice sheet is 10,000 feet thick at its highest, at its thickest. And what happens is that when it starts to melt, uh, it gets, it gets uh, the water is, uh, absorbs more sunlight than the ice. That's a feedback, a positive feedback. It melts more ice. This water starts to flow. And when water starts to flow, lots of erosion, lots of mass transfer, it really accelerates the change. We see these uh, uh, earthquakes or ice quakes occurring with regularity in the ice sheet. And what happens, too, is they now know that these moulons can burrow their way all the way down to the bottom of the ice sheet. And when they do, they can lubricate the ice sheet and move it faster to the ocean. I'll talk about glaciers uh, a little bit later. OK, but at sea level rise, here's the history of sea level rise, and then the projection. And if you look at the latest projections on sea level rise, here's what we've been seeing. And here are the projections. And I think, uh, and this is in line with what Casper said. He said most of the scientific uh, projections now are between 1 and 2 meters sea level rise by 2100. And you can see here at the bottom is a little bit less than 3 feet. At the top is around 6 feet, which is about 2 meters. So that's what people are now expecting. That's an enormous sea level rise. If you look at what happened, if you look at all the coastal communities, you know, there's, there's 17 million people that, that live within just a couple feet of, of sea level in Bangladesh, for example, people that would be displaced. How are we going to deal with all those people? Cities are going to have to build seawalls, a uh, very expensive proposition. Let me also say that Jim Hansen, who's director of the Guidance Institute for Space Studies, he believes that we'll see three meters of sea level rise by 2100. And a couple, about five years ago, everybody said, boy, he's crazy. But every year, the numbers get closer to his number. He has an uncanny record for making good predictions. He's, it was his group that made a very, very uh, spot-on prediction for how much the Earth cooled uh, after the uh, eruption of Mount Pinatubo, for example. So the fact that someone with a track record like him is predicting that, no, it, it'll be 10 feet of sea level rise is especially alarming. The skeptics say the IPCC was wrong about Himalayan glaciers disappearing in 2035. Yep, there's a mistake in here. This is volume two, uh, and on page 493, there's two lines in here that are a mistake. 
So we should probably throw this whole report out, don't you think? Uh, I worked in an international group, and I can tell you, um, if an international body puts out a 1,000-page volume, and again, this is one of three volumes, each 1,000 pages. If they put out a 1,000-page volume, and it's got one mistake in it, they're doing darn good. But what they did is they quoted a WWF report, which had not been peer-reviewed, that said Himalayan glaciers could disappear by 2035. The latest USGS pro pro projection for glaciers in, in uh, Glacier National Park in the US is that those glaciers will be gone by 2020 to 2025. All the glaciers will be gone in Glacier National Park. The Himalayan glaciers are much higher in altitude, of course. It's going to take longer for them to completely disappear. So to say they'll be completely gone, possibly by 2035, was a mistake. And so IPCC really uh, got taken a task for that. You saw all the skeptics say, don't believe the IPCC. They don't know what they're talking about. Here's another one I saw in one of those books that I showed earlier. For every retreating glacier, there's an advancing one. Every retreating glacier, there's an advancing one. OK, so let's look at the science on this. First of all, with all the hoopla about the mistake that occurred in the IPCC report, what people weren't covering is what is really happening to the glaciers in the Himalayas. Here's a picture of uh, uh, the East Rongbuk Glacier on, on the east side of Mount Everest, August 1921. Here it is, October 2008. Look at these glaciers here and what's happened here, here and what's happened here. Incredible shrinkage. There was a, a ex, National Geographic magazine has been doing a fantastic job of covering energy and covering climate change. And just about six months ago, they had an article on what is happening in the Himalayas, that how, it, how the loss of glaciers, and basically this provides drinking water and irrigation water for about two billion people. And this loss of this water and, and the sudden release in the spring is causing havoc in the Himalayas already. So lost in the fact that IPCC made a minor error is the fact that Himalayan glaciers are really in trouble. What about this, for every glacier advancing, there's, there's, uh, there's one that's retreating. Or every, uh, every retreating, there's one that's, that's advancing. Well, there's a World Glacier Monitoring Service, and they keep track of these glaciers all around the world. And here's the plot. And the, the blue, and this is 19, uh, for those of you who can't see the numbers here, 1965, 1985, 2005. The blue ones are advancing, um, and the red ones are retreating. So what you're seeing is that 90% of the glaciers around the world are retreating, not advancing. Not only that, but of the 400 or so glaciers that were studied back in 2005, the 26 that were advancing, most of them were in the South Island of New Zealand, and most of them were thinning faster than they were advancing. So yeah, they're advancing, OK? Um, but at the same time, they're losing more ice. Here's glacier mass. That's a really way to look at it. And this is the World Glacier Monitoring Service. And this is the top curve is reference glaciers, and the bottom curve is all glaciers. But here we go from 1980 uh, to 2008 here. Okay, You can see the loss of glacier mass. Tremendous loss of, ma of, of glacier mass here. And now you see how this is curving downward, concave downward. That means the, the, the mass loss is accelerating. One of the problems is that you know, we, we don't see what's happening. This is happening up in the Arctic. We don't see it. So I want to give you an image here of what's happening. This is a, a, a film clip taken by Jim Baylog. He's a photographer out of Boulder. He's done work for National Geographic magazine. He does an incredible job documenting what's happening. So this is a glacier calving event that occurred on June 9, 2007. It's speeded up about four or five times, just so that you know, so it's not quite as jerky. So it doesn't happen quite as fast as you see it, but almost as fast. And superimposed on it is the U.S. Capitol building. I think you all agree that's a pretty big building. And it gives you an idea of the scale. So what is that about? Maybe 20 or 30 U.S. Capitol buildings of, of ice volume. Remember, a lot, most of the volume of ice is underwater. What do you think, when you think of something moving at a glacial pace, how fast do you think that is? I think we, you all think pretty slow, right? There are glaciers in Alaska uh, and, and Greenland right now that are moving toward the ocean as fast as an average rate of five feet per hour. That's how fast these glaciers are moving toward the ocean. Skeptics say, well, OK, that's the Arctic. But you know, in the Antarctic, it's gaining ice. It's getting cold down there, and it's gaining ice. What's the truth? 
Well, here's a Larson B ice shelf breakup, March 2002. This is an area about the size of Rhode Island. This ice, ice shelf broke off. This was floating in the water, so when it broke up, it didn't contribute to sea level rise. All right. And what we know now is happening is these ice shelves in the Antarctic, particularly on the West Antarctic Peninsula, are melting at a much more rapid rate than scientists first thought because they're not really melting from the top, they're melting from underneath. What's happening is uh, the warm ocean is getting under and it's melting these, uh, these ice shelves from, from underneath. And so what happens is they don't directly contribute to sea level rise. When these ice shelves break off, they're sort of like corks in a bottle. They hold the land-based glaciers. That ice, that when, when it gets to the ocean, will raise sea level. They hold those glaciers back. Since the Larsen B ice shelf broke off, this one glacier is, it has, has moved, uh, started moving 510% faster. This other one moved 400% faster over a period of two years. So it, ultimately, it does have consequences on sea level rise. The other thing is we have a, an interesting way of directly measuring the mass of these ice sheets at the North and South Pole. And the way they do it, NASA uses these twin satellites called the Gray Satellites. And what happens is, you know, when a satellite goes over an area with more mass, more ice, there's more gravitational pull, and that satellite will accelerate. So when the first satellite of these pair of satellites hits an area with more ice, it moves further away from the second satellite. And all they do, very simply, is they measure the distance with a, a laser finder between these two satellites. And when the distance increases, it means the first satellite went over an area with more mass. And so they can plot out the ice sheet mass. They do that for both the North Pole and the South Pole. Here's what they get. The left is the Greenland ice sheet. That's the, the main ice sheet of, of, uh, uh, in, the, in the northern hemisphere. Southern hemisphere, this is the, all of the, the whole Antarctic ice sheet, east and west Antarctica. And again, you can see both are going down in ice mass, and both curves are concave downward, which means they're accelerating. Of even greater concern, I would say, is this melting permafrost. All right, so as this ice melts, you've probably seen in Alaska, they had to relocate some villages. In some cases, uh, roads have buckled. Uh, because the permafrost, uh, that area that's permanently frozen all throughout the year is now starting to melt. And so there's vegetation in there that's decomposing and it's emitting carbon dioxide and methane. And one of the problems is methane, which is the main component of natural gas, is 25 times as powerful as carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So this is, uh, a lot of scientists consider this basically a ticking time bomb that all this methane is down there and it's starting to be released. There's a work that's been done on this at the University of Alaska, and I, I have a, a short film clip. Here's a, a lake. That's methane coming directly out of the lake because the, the vegetation is decomposing under it as, as the permafrost melts. In Siberia, there are huge amounts of, uh, of vegetation, and, and, uh, and, and when they decompose, methane is going to be generated huge amounts of methane. So this is a real concern to scientists right now. It's very hard to estimate it, uh, but it could result in a very, very big increase, a very big positive feedback to our global warming. Another thing I've heard the skeptics say is, OK, uh, well, OK, it's warming. Uh, we're causing it. But so what? You know, I can play golf more. You know, we can, there's certain places where you, you, know, you have longer growing season. Isn't that good? So who's to say a warming climate is bad? Who's to say that today's climate is the best one? In fact, this was actually a statement made by the head of NASA on NPR when he was interviewed back in 2007. It got the NASA scientists pretty up in arms when he made that statement. OK, so very simply, if you look at the history of, of, of human beings, we, Homo sapiens, our species, has been around for about um, 130,000 years. Now, so if you go back and you dig up a skeleton of one of us, Homo sapiens, going back 130,000 years ago, and you look at the brain cavity, it's as big as ours. Those guys were just as smart as we were. OK, yeah, they didn't go to school. Uh, but they had the same brain capacity, the same intelligence that we do. So why, if we were walking around this planet for 130,000 years, why did it take us so long to actually build cities, uh, do agriculture? Why were we just hunters gatherers all that, all that period of time? Well, let's look at the history of the climate. This is the Holocene. If you go back 10, 12,000 years, very cold climate. Okay? And then we get into this interglacial here, and we get a very constant, steady climate over the last 10,000 years. This is really unusual. 
We were really lucky to have this very long, steady climate. And look at this. This is plus or minus half a degree Celsius, about plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit. The temperature was really steady over this period of time. A great, steady climate to develop civilization in. Let's look at sea level. Here was sea level going back 24,000 years, 18,000, 16, 14, 12,000, 10,000. 8,000 years ago, look what happened. Sea level was changing dramatically over this last 8,000 years for cities that developed near the ocean, very, very constant sea level rise, sea level. You saw before what we're doing in sea level rise. Here's what we're doing in temperature. Remember this temperature, this, this period that we've developed civilization, and during that 10,000 years, human beings, every planet, every animal on the earth has adapted to that unusually steady temperature climate. And now this is what we're doing. These are the projections of the IPCC. By 2100, 3 degrees Celsius, 4 degrees Celsius, 5 degrees Celsius, you can, uh, the, the degrees Fahrenheit would be a little bit less than double these, multiplied by 1.8 to get the increase in degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So these are enormous rises. This one here, this scenario is A1FI. FI stands for fossil intensive. That's the red one, and that's the one that we've been, that was back in 2000. They said, well, what's the worst that can be? Well, we'll just burn fossil fuel like crazy. So we're going to have that scenario, A1FI. That's what it was. They didn't anticipate the growth of China. So with all those coal plants China's been building, we're actually putting a lot more carbon into the atmosphere than we, we thought, even in the worst case scenario. And so we're exceeding the worst case scenario. So these are what the models say. The models say we could get these enormous temperature rises by 2100. OK, so I just want to summarize the evidence. Uh, th these, are, th these are a couple of graphics that were put together by uh, NOAA, and, and uh, this is a fairly detailed graphic. I'm not going to go into it uh, uh, in any depth here. I just want to point out, first, is the world warming? The point is, there's many, many separate independent pieces of evidence to indicate that, yes, the climate is warming. What's happening to the snow cover? What's happening to the glaciers? What's happening to the temperatures in the land? What's happening to sea? What's happening to the actual distribution of the heat content? What's happening to the ice sheets? All these things, all these things are happening. They all point to a warming globe. You know, I talk about whether there's debate on this subject. I regularly go to the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. When you go to that meeting and you go to sessions there, there are no skeptics. No one is saying, well, gee, is it warming? Are we causing it? That discussion does not take place. Instead, these scientists, every year, they have special forums. What are we doing wrong? How can we communicate this better? Why is the public not listening to us? A tremendous degree of frustration, but no argument about the fact that the planet is warming or that we're causing it. Casper used the, the word fingerprints before. I think that's an excellent uh, term to use. All these are human fingerprints. Our fingerprints are all over this if you're willing to open your eyes and look at the evidence. Okay, this is what's happening. What's happening to the, the, the again, because the stratosphere is cooling, the, the troposphere is warming, uh, nights are warming faster than days. Uh, we can actually measure the radiation that's coming back at the Earth. We can measure that directly and see that it's increasing. So again, all these independent means indicate, yes, not only is it warming, but we're causing that warming. Finally, look, if you had a sick child, and that, let's say your child had a brain tumor, God forbid, you probably wouldn't be relying on the geologist who lives on your block for advice, okay? You wouldn't be asking, uh, you may start with your family physician, but you'd go well beyond that. You'd want to talk to the experts. So what are the most prestigious scientific organizations in this country? Well, there's the National Academy of Science. Because of this big climate gate uh, uh, brouhaha that, ha that happened uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the media, they felt compelled, gosh, we better come out with a special statement because people are getting confused about this. So here's their statement. A strong, credible body of scientific evidence shows that climate change is occurring, is caused largely by human activities, and poses significant risk for a broad range of human and natural systems. That's a pretty clear statement. The American Association of the Advancement of Science, our, our largest professional society for, for general sciences, uh, they published Science Magazine along with Nature, considered one of the two most prestigious uh, general scientific journals in the world. They came out with a statement that said, the vast preponderance of evidence based on years of research conducted by a wide array of different investigators at many institutions clearly indicates that global climate change is real, 
It is caused largely by human activities, and the need to take action is urgent. Pretty unmistakable statement. This is what the experts say. So I want to make one, have one more quote for you here. Paul Simon from the Boxer, 1968. Still a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. And that's where we're at. People don't want to hear this. If they don't believe in government regulation, they don't want to put a price on carbon, they will listen to what the skeptics say. All right? They're a great audience for the skeptics. I could only touch on the various skeptic arguments. There, there are more arguments. If you want to be more versed on this subject, and I, I realize we probably don't have many skeptics here. I'm, I'm guessing most of you uh, understand climate science and, and believe that we're causing the problems. But if you'd like to be able to better respond to skeptic arguments, I recommend you go to this website. There's a young physics graduate in Australia named John Cook, and he has a website called skepticalscience.com, I think, www.skepticalscience.com. He's done a fantastic job of listing all the arguments, and for each one, he's even got to the point where he gives a beginner's explanation, an intermediate explanation, an advanced explanation, and he gives you links to the scientific journals when you get to the more advanced explanations, so you can actually see what the answers are. He's even gone to the, the, the extent of he's got an iPhone application, and he's got uh, a, no, a Nokia and an Android application. So if you have a smartphone, you can walk around with the scientific response to all the skeptic arguments here. He's really done a great job. He does this for free. Doesn't make any money. Nobody pays him. Anyway, thank you for listening. If we have time, I'm happy to answer any questions. I do give talks on climate change and how to address it. This one today was a little bit different, and I came here as an individual. I didn't come here as an, as, as an NREL representative because I wasn't talking about renewable. I wasn't talking about the solutions. Um, but in general, I give talks about climate change, the urgency, and how to deal with it. All right? And I might give those talks um, maybe a dozen times a year. All right? But there's a local co-op in Colorado that, that, that you know, burns coal to provide electricity, and they do that because they feel it's good for their customers, it's cheap electricity, and they feel very strongly uh, that, against anything that would change that. And they have a, an individual that's, that says he's given a presentation that climate change is a big hoax, and I've been to his presentation, and I've questioned him on his slides, uh, but he's given this presentation, it's posted on their website, he's given it to, he says, over 100 audiences around the state. So the problem is there are people whose full-time job it is to go around and give the misinformation. And for those of us that work in the field, this is not my full-time job. I do this kind of on the side. I have a full-time job working on solar energy research, working on geothermal energy research. So I think that's one of the things that we face is the fact that the skeptics have put a lot of time and effort and money into people who are actually, frankly, very good communicators. And not all scientists are good communicators. They weren't brought up to be good communicators. They are brought up to be good scientists. And so when they get thrust out into the arena of, of giving public presentations, they're not necessarily comfortable with that. You know, Jim Hansen, I would say, is probably the foremost climate scientist in the world. He goes out and he gives public presentations, and I, I see the skeptics saying, oh, you know, he's just trying to make, you know, be famous. And he hates giving public presentations. He'd rather be in his, in his laboratory working into the odd hours of the night. You can tell he's just not comfortable giving public presentations. He does it because he has grandkids, and he just feels an ethical obligation. Gosh, I, I've got to get out there and tell people about this. So there's a real problem there in terms of this communications war. The scientists are losing the communications war, and that's what you see reflected in these public opinion polls. You know, people sometimes say, hey, Chuck, you know, you're, you're preaching to the choir. And, and I try to preach to everybody, not just the choir. But one of my responses to that was, is, yeah, I'm preaching to the choir, but you know what? The choir isn't doing enough. The choir doesn't really get how serious this is, all right? And, and, and so what can you do? I mean, first of all, Colorado is a great place. Look at what we've done. I mean, we were the first uh, state to have a, a voter-initiated renewable portfolio standard. Didn't come out of the state legislature. Later, the state legislature added to it. We're lucky, to, we're lucky, we're lucky for what Max has done, okay? We, we have strong, we have, we've had a great governor, we've had great legislators, so I would say one of the things we can do is keep doing what we're doing more of it because we set an example for the rest of the states. If we can get a national renewable portfolio standard, uh, that would go a long way to, uh, as soon as people see that, you know what, when you deploy efficiency in renewables, you actually save the economy money, you actually make jobs. When, when people really get that, okay, 
then I think you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna see a feedback effect, and, the, and it's really going to take off. So I think we do, need, need to keep doing that. I mean, ultimately, we need a price on carbon, but obviously, the politics is such it's hard to do it in this country. You know, some people feel that at some point, China may put a price on carbon. China could become the world leader in this. I mean, not only are they putting, they, yes, they have been putting in a lot of coal plants, but they have big health problems that they have to deal with. And they also are the world leaders in, in PV manufacturing, solar hot water heaters. They'll soon be probably number one in wind uh, uh, turbine installations. It's, and they're talking about possibly developing a cap and trade system. They could become the leaders if the US doesn't. But right now, at least at the state level, we've had really good leadership. And I think we just need to do more of it.